6, 8, 12, 36. Oh no, I meant 30. Who has got the optimum number of proportion units? Today, we'll be analyzing the engineering trade-offs involved in this question. The video is structured as follows. First, I'll briefly go over the modeling that was used to analyze this question. Then we'll examine two benefits of having multiple propulsors, namely rotor motor matching and redundancy. Afterwards, we will look at one drawback, which is an increased disc loading. And finally, we analyze the powertrain in terms of input voltage, motor sizing and efficiency for these different configurations. We modeled propulsor units, which consists of a rotor and an electric powertrain. Of course, you can also use a ducted fan instead of the open rotor. The rotor model is based on the fruit rankine momentum theory. The powertrain and its components are modeled as an equivalent electric circuit. The motor is characterized with three constants, of which the most important one is the motor speed constant. This is also known as the KV rating. Benefits of multiple propulsors. For example, here we have a small and a large proportion unit. The large rotor has a power and torque requirement. The electric motor can deliver the power, but not the torque. Hence, a gearbox is required. Interestingly, this phenomenon occurs when the proportion unit is scaled up. In other words, when the power is increased. I'm now going to explain why. The reason is related to having a maximum blade tip speed. Normally, the blade tip speed must be kept below Mach number 0.8 to prevent the formation of shock waves. Shock waves create additional drag, namely wave drag, which increases the propeller torque and therefore decreases propeller efficiency. Furthermore, noise is correlated with the blade tip speed. Therefore, an even lower blade tip speed, such as Mach number 0.6, can be required. Note that the blade tip speed limit applies to rotors of any diameter. Let us come back to our example from before. Say we design the blade tip speed to equal Mach number 0.6 for both the small and the large propulsor. This would be designing for low noise. Let's also say that both propellers are subject to the same flow conditions. Here, V infinity is the velocity of the incoming flow and rho is the air density. So for example, they're installed on two respective aircraft that fly at the same speed, V infinity, and altitude, which corresponds to rho. If the incoming flow and blade tip speed are the same, we will see that they have the same advance ratio. The advance ratio is an important parameter for determining the propeller torque coefficient. If you're new to this, do not worry. The propeller torque coefficient is basically analogous to an airfault drag coefficient. For example, thrust is required to overcome an airfall drag, and similarly, motor torque is required to overcome propeller torque. They are dimensionless coefficients, which makes them useful because they can be used in the following way. For example, an air force drag coefficient depends on three parameters, as shown by the figure. It depends on the angle of attack, the x-axis, the Reynolds number, the different colored lines, and the airfoil geometry, NACA 0012. Similarly, a propeller torque coefficient depends on the advance ratio, Reynolds number, and propeller geometry. Therefore, the same torque coefficient can be used for propellers of any diameter, provided the advance ratio, Reynolds number, and relative geometry remains constant. So the dimensionless coefficient is not dependent on the absolute geometry. Lastly, the power coefficient is simply the torque coefficient times 2 pi. Consider this propeller for the scenario where you want to increase the propeller thrust and therefore you also need to increase the power supplied to it by the shaft. The equation for the required shaft power is as shown. This can be derived from a dimensional analysis. So the shaft power is a function of the power coefficient, air density, revolutions per unit time, and the propeller diameter. Now remember how we talked about the torque and power coefficients a moment ago? This is where our previous analysis becomes useful. Let's say that when we increase the thrust, the power coefficient and air density remain constant. As we agreed previously, this is because we are analyzing for the same flight conditions airspeed and altitude. Also, we can express the revolutions per unit time 
in terms of plate tip speed and diameter like so. If you recall, the angular velocity can be defined like so. And these two equations can be rearranged for the equation on the left. Now, if we insert all of these into the power equation, we can see that the required shaft power is proportional to the plate tip speed cubed and the diameter squared. So what we have done here is hidden the power coefficient, air density, and one over pi cubed into a constant as reflected by the proportionality symbol. This was for the purpose of keeping the equation short and easy to read. So if you want to increase the propeller power, we can either increase the blade tip speed or the propeller diameter. However, we agreed that the propeller blade tip speed remains constant for the reasons described earlier, propeller efficiency and noise. This constraint has a profound effect. We know that power equals rotational speed times torque. We can express this equation into the same format, rotational speed times torque. Therefore, the conclusion is, if you want to increase the power and keep the blade tip speed constant, you can only do so by increasing the propeller diameter. If you increase the diameter, you have to reduce the rotational speed. Your propeller torque drastically increases with the propeller diameter. For example, if we double the propeller diameter, we increase the torque eightfold. We halve the rotational speed and we increase the power fourfold. Motor mass scales more strongly with torque than with power. For simplicity, the motor's maximum torque can be used to approximate the motor's mass. If we double the rotor's diameter, we increase the required torque and therefore the motor mass eightfold, as shown just a moment ago. Alternatively, we can keep the rotor diameter constant and increase the number of rotors instead. In this example, four smaller rotors are needed to match the fourfold power increase of the larger rotor. Note how the total disk area is the same, and therefore the disk loading and propeller efficiency would be the same too. This is when momentum theory is applied. In the example below, the required torque and motor mass is increased fourfold. The same analysis can be applied to Joby Aviation's and Archer Aviation's concepts, 6 versus 12 rotors. This scaling characteristic means that small electric drones do not need gearboxes. By contrast, larger electric aircraft may require one. An example is Archer Aviation's Midnight concept. In 2022, they showcased a rotor concept with a gearbox. The gearbox reduced the electric motor torque requirement and reduced the overall system mass. The best example of scaling the propulsion power with the sheer number of propulsor units is the Lilium jet. In their previous design iteration, they had 36 ducted fans. For reasons explained later on, they have recently reduced this number to 30. Let us now look at the relationship between redundancy and number of propulsors. As per existing regulatory requirements, multi-engine aircraft must offer safe trim capability and enough power to climb with one engine in operative. For eVTOLs, the highest power demand occurs at the vertical climb segment. From a force and moment balance, it can be shown that a vehicle at this condition, vertical takeoff with one engine in operative, at least one other rotor must be thought of down to trim for pitch and roll. So, the pitching moment created by an engine failure must be trimmed by an equal and opposite moment. Similarly, the rolling moment must be trimmed by an equal and opposite moment. The remaining rotors must be throttled up to achieve the desired force balance and, therefore, vertical climb performance. By comparing the nominal and the one engine in operative cases, we can see that the number of rotors times their nominal thrust equals the number of remaining rotors times their OEI thrust. The proportion units are sized for the OEI case. After rearranging this equation, we can see that the number of rotors influence the thrust reserve 
and by extension, power reserve. In this example, the thrust for OEI needs to be 33% higher than the nominal case. Hence, the thrust reserve is 33%. Let's examine how these thrust reserves change with the number of propulsion units. This graph shows thrust required per rotor for concepts with 6, 8 and 12 rotors. The trend is that the thrust reserve decreases with the number of rotors. So, if you increase the number of rotors, you decrease the thrust required per rotor in the nominal case and you decrease the thrust reserve. Using momentum theory, the power reserve was calculated. Notice the trend is similar, but the power reserves are bigger relative to the thrust reserves. This is explained by momentum theory as shown by the equation for hover. The remaining rotors have to generate more thrust at the OEI case and hover power is proportional to thrust raised to the power of 1.5. Therefore, the trend would speak in favor of smaller and more numerous rotor units, especially if you consider it in combination with the rotor-motor scaling characteristics mentioned a few minutes ago. However, there are drawbacks which we will examine next. With this example tilt rotor concept, we can analyze the effects of geometrical constraints. The front tilt rotors are on the wing rather than on the fuselage, so they have the freedom to tilt. The aft rotors are symmetrical to the pitch and roll axis to achieve moment balance during hover. We can represent the rotors like so. Therefore, as you can see, the wingspan approximately equals the sum of the rotor diameters. Let us assume the wingspan is constrained to 50 meters, so the aircraft is compatible with ground infrastructure like helipads. Therefore, if we reduce the number of rotors, we can increase the disc area, and vice versa. Assuming the aircraft's maximum takeoff weight is fixed to around 3000 kilograms, as per IASA's special condition for VTOL, this trend in disc area affects disc loading. Disc loading is a key parameter for rotorcraft performance, so let us examine that next. As shown from this graph, the disc loading generally increases with the number of rotors. However, as we have seen in the examination of our thrust and power reserves, the difference in disc loading between nominal and one engine and operative reduces as you increase the number of rotors. The trend in total power reserve would be as shown. Note that this is the change in the total power reserve, which is due to the change in disc loading. The power reserve per rotor is much larger, as shown previously. This is because there are fewer rotors working. Remember, there is one engine inoperative, and one other engine is throttled down for trimming the vehicle. So for example, taking Joby Aviation's concept, the power per rotor would be 600 kilowatts divided by the four remaining rotors. Next, I'm going to show you my analysis of the rotor and powertrain at these different throttle settings. Consider this electric powertrain sized for Joby Aviation, the concept with six tilt rotors. This graph shows the shaft power for different rotational speeds at a constant input voltage, 789 volts. Some basics first. At a rotational speed of zero, the electric motor is stalled because the torque applied to it is higher than the maximum torque it can deliver. If we lower the torque applied to the electric motor, the rotational speed increases. At the maximum rotational speed, the electric motor is no longer doing useful work and is only overcoming bearing friction. Hence, the useful power is zero. The electric motor's operating region is between the maximum shaft power and the maximum efficiency. At maximum power, the powertrain's efficiency is 50%, and the maximum efficiency in this model varies between 70 to 80%. The rotor's power curve is like so. Remember, for a constant power coefficient and air density, rotor power is proportional to the rotational speed cubed. A constant power coefficient can be achieved with a variable blade pitch propeller. In this example, the design point was chosen at a rotational speed of 136 radians per second. This is equivalent to a blade tip speed of Mach number 
at sea level conditions. If you want to throttle down, for normal vertical climb and cruise, the input voltage has to be lowered. This can be done with pulse width modulation, which effectively controls the average input voltage to the electric motor. An electric speed controller can provide pulse width modulation. By lowering the input voltage, the rotational speed is lowered as per the KV constant. And just to be clear, we're using the same electric motor for all these different throttle settings. As you can see from the line intersections, the powertrain efficiency changes with the throttle settings. At a lower throttle setting, it becomes more efficient. The same analysis can be conducted for the vertical airspace concept. Here, we are looking at the powertrain for one of its front tilt rotor. Note that the design point has a lower power and a higher rotational speed. This is because this concept has a smaller rotor diameter and therefore it can turn faster for the same blade tip speed limit of Mach number 0.8 at sea level conditions. There's an interesting point about a partial tilt rotor concept. At nominal cruise, the required shaft power is higher than nominal vertical climb. This is because for nominal vertical climb, it is using eight rotors, whereas for nominal cruise, it is only using four tilt rotors. Let us now summarize everything. As we have discussed, the optimum number of propulsors is a complex trade-off. For example, increasing the number of rotors from eight to 12 can be beneficial because it reduces the total electric motor mass by around 33%. It also reduces the required power reserve per rotor by 23 kilowatts. However, it increases disc loading by 240 newtons per meter squared at the one engine in operative case. Concepts with fewer propulsor units require larger power reserves. We have seen that larger power reserves means potentially higher powertrain efficiency at nominal operation where the throttle is lower low blade tip speed at nominal operation. For example, the blade tip speed can be Mach number 0.8 at one engine in operative. And for nominal vertical takeoff, when the rotors are at a lower throttle setting, the blade tip speed can be Mach number 0.6 for low noise reasons. Of course, larger power reserves means more thrust available. However, the cost is an increase in proportion system mass and the need to develop very high torque motors and high voltage systems, which is a novelty. I should mention that other factors such as aerodynamics, aeroelasticity and optimum propulsive distribution were not included in this video. In 2022, Lilium has reduced the number of ductive fans from 36 to 30 and they have increased the rotor diameter. As we have discussed in this video, this should increase their total disc area and thereby lower their disc loading. The trade-off is a drastically higher motor torque requirement per rotor and therefore an increase in the total motor mass. My next video is going to analyze the Linium Jet in more detail. If you like, then please follow my channel. Thank you for listening.